Welcome to Animal Chat, an Alberta FPCA podcast where we talk about animal welfare, animal behavior, and animal protection. I'm Dan Kobe, and thank you for listening and for being passionate about animal welfare and compassionate for the animals in our province. Today, we're going to bust down some myths about dog training. There are lots of thoughts that permeate about tricks and techniques for training a dog, and in many cases, they're not actually that accurate and could even cause fear in your dog. My guest today is certified professional dog trainer, Chris Rooney from Monistic Hills Dog Training. Thank you for joining me today, Chris. Hi, Dan. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. I'm uh, pretty happy to be here. Now, Chris has three dogs and you may hear them in the background from time to time today. They're outside as we're recording this, but as everyone knows, dogs uh, will want to come in and go out and probably one at a time. But the three dogs are Angus, Quinn and Cooper. Chris, tell us about your dogs. (laughs) <laughs> well, let's hope we don't actually hear from them because it is truly a case of let me in, let me out. Oh, and no, we can't all come and go at the same time. It's one at a time. So um, there are three, as you said. Angus is my dear old man um, who's 16. And uh, he's actually the dog that got me into training because he was such a terrible, terrible puppy. And I thought, you know, this dog is, is so bad. I don't even know if I can take him off the property. But um, we made it through and he actually went on to, um, to, to a long career of coming to school with me as, uh, as an assistant because I was the counselor at, at my school. Um, and you've met Quinn, the golden retriever, who's, who's very sweet and uh, very pretty. And Cooper is our other golden retriever. And he's, a, he's one of those lovely creamy colored dogs that I didn't know I was in love with the light colored ones, but I, I am now for sure. Now, both of those guys have just turned three. So they're very busy and they can be rather silly at times, which drives Angus crazy because uh, his, his inner border collie sort of feels a need to, to manage their behavior. So there's a lot of barking and refereeing that goes on in, in my household. And we'll mention this again later on in the podcast, but uh, we always have show notes and we always get pictures up onto the show notes on our website. So anyone listening to this podcast that wants to see the animals that we're talking about or some of the things we're talking about today, we'll make sure that we get some pictures up so you can see Angus, Quinn and Cooper. Okay, so let's start with the biggest uh, myth probably in dog training, um, and that's that I need to establish dominance over my dog and prove I'm the alpha. Not the case, correct? Right. Uh, the idea that dog owner needs to be the alpha and, and exert dominance over their dog is one that is changing somewhat, luckily, but it, it does still persist. So I always say that, you know, instead of feeling that you need to be loud and bossy and manipulative, like physically manipulative with your dog, it's actually more appropriate to think in terms of being like a family unit. Um, the alpha idea grew from research doc- that a Dr. David Meck did with a group of wolves in the 1970s. He uh, noted that there was a pattern of aggressiveness and submissiveness and, and, and assumed that that was how the pack functioned. But since then, he's come out and said that he got it wrong. Uh, in reality, a, a natural wolf pack operates more like a family with uh, older, experienced adults and the youngsters. Now, you actually are going to have a better relationship with your dog if you behave more like the grown up who guides a child and teaches them what you want as you strive for that, that perfect dog that you want to live with. So as you're working to develop this relationship with your dog, and presuming that a lot of the times this will come at a time when they're quite young, um, I I think most of us see food as a treat, uh, as a way to do it. That's probably the easiest way to get your dog's attention, especially if you have a a food motivated dog. Uh, So let's get this out of the way right now and just have you explain how you should be using the food as a reward when training your dog. Well, um, it's pretty common, all right, and and it's really, really quite effective. Um, The idea is that you deliver a treat after your dog has given you the behavior that you've asked for. So it's a little bit like putting a sticker on a a kid's spelling test after they've scored a great mark, not waving the sticker under his nose um, prior to writing the test. And for your dog, it provides immediate feedback with um, something that appeals to him, which is the food. And then he knows that he got the answer right. 
And I guess you can say the biggest difference between reward and bribery is that you might consider yourself bribing if you're using the food to get your dog to do something he already knows how to do, like sit or down. But it's important to phase the, the food lures out once, um, once your dog knows the behavior. Now, that being said, it's not fair to get rid of the food treats altogether. Um, you need to think of it a little bit as your dog's paycheck. And would you keep working if all your boss was giving you was a pat on the head when, when you did a, a job well done? So you got to kind of keep that in mind. Um, now, food's not the only reward that you, you should consider. Uh, play, like um, a game of fetch, is, is really motivating for some dogs. Um, the granting of a privilege is also a really, really effective one, and, and one that I, I definitely recommend that people make use of. So an example of that would be opening the back door to let him go outside when he has kind of asked politely and giving you a sit or eye can contact at the door. Using rewards like those are important because um, you're not always going to be walking around with cookies in your pocket. Although some people probably do. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, um, yeah, I've, I've washed many a jacket and uh, a pair of pants and found a mushed up mess of dog treats in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always a trainer. <laughs> and you're probably not the first person to have that problem. So some people may think that when you are feeding your dog if you're there are treats obviously uh, cookies uh, that are meant for the dog but there's also uh, people food part of it um, and I know that some people will say that if I'm if I'm providing people food to my dog that I'm just teaching him to beg at the table is that the case <laughs> well yeah if you feed him people food from the table you are probably going to teach him that hanging around the table works really nicely um, and, and that uh, that's a good way to get snacks. So uh, using people food is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Of course, you've you got to pay attention to your, your dog's um, tummy sensitivities and, and that kind of thing, you know, and be careful about what you actually give him. But if you're using human food like a, a leftover barbecued steak or or chicken or something along that line, it can be really effective as a training tool because it's a novelty and it tastes really fantastic. Um, something like steak or chicken, cheese, hot dogs, that kind of thing can be used in um, environments where there's a lot of distraction and that you really need to have your dog's attention on you. Um, it's um, it's kind of like you getting a piece of lobster versus uh, a dry old cracker that lobster is going to get your attention and dogs uh, certainly uh, will be able with their noses determine in, in a hurry what type of treat you're providing <laughs> um, corporal punishment hitting your dog or dragging your dog or pushing them down or, or smacking them on the rear end those types of aggressive uh, training techniques I think drive uh, a lot of us uh, crazy when you see someone else doing it, say at a dog park or whatever. What signals are you sending to your dog when you do this? Well, actually smacking him around or, or freaking out like that may teach him to be afraid of you. It's certainly not building respect. Um, I, I think the thing that he's going to figure out is that you are unpredictable and you are prone to outbursts that make no sense to him whatsoever. So a whack on the bum it hasn't really taught him what, what you want him to do or what do you want him to know. And after a while, you know, when you swing your hand or you put your hand towards your dog, is he going to shy away? Because you've been just too, too, um, too strange and unpredictable, like I said. So that probably goes toward my next question. And, and that's, um, you know, rubbing your dog's nose in a mess that they've made in the house. Uh, if they had an accident, didn't make it outside in time. And and I I know with this one the challenge is the same as with corporal punishment is the dog may not be understanding cause and effect the way that a human being is hey, oh for sure for sure and, and if you think about it how on earth is your nose getting rubbed in that disgusting mess any connection to what you really want your dog to do you know like and you're just going to end up having to clean up the dog later on as well so no that's not letting him know what he should be doing. Um, 
you're building a sense that uh, you can't be trusted and he's not sure what you're going to do next. And the after effects of that is, is your dog may end up having more behavioral problems, not fewer. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, um, so instead what you want to be doing is, um, well, revisiting potty training 101. Is this dog really actually potty trained? Does he get it? Um, or you, you maybe need to ask yourself, well, did I leave him too long? Um, is there a medical situation going on, you know, like a urinary tract infection or, or maybe he's got diarrhea because of something ridiculous that he ate in the garbage. You know, there's, they don't, they don't do it to get back at you. So instead of rubbing his nose in it, uh, I always tell people, you know, just stay calm, try to keep your body language quite neutral and clean up the mess and don't make a big deal out of it. Cause, um, sure, you're going to be frustrated, but your reaction might lead him to assume that, okay, it's not really safe to, to potty in front of this, this, this person. So I'm going to sneak off behind the couch and do it there. Or I'm going to sneak off downstairs where nobody will see me. And then of course I, I have dealt with some, some dog owners who say to me, well, I take him outside and he won't pee in front of me. Well, then you've really, really created that extreme situation where it's not safe to go to the bathroom in front of my owner because she freaks out. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. So it, it can create um, more of a mess than, than what you're planning on, for sure, for sure. Which sort of leads to my next thought, which is that I think we have uh, a lot of people do anyway. I don't want to put everyone in this category, but a lot of people have a habit of putting human emotion and human logic on their animal because they show facial expressions that, hey, that reminds me of uh, when I'm sad and and, and the uh, emotions that I have. And the dog is not a human. The dog is a dog. And therefore, uh, assuming that they are feeling the same way you're feeling when you have that similar face is probably, uh, well, I'm going to say, you know, almost certainly not connected. Uh, and so I'll use the example of when you when you get home, and you left your dog home, maybe a little bit too long, and your favorite pair of slippers are ripped up, maybe a pillow off the couch, the dog was bored, whatever. And there's a mess. And but the dog looks guilty when you come in. It's, you know, a lot of people are going to say, hey, the dog knows better because they look guilty, that they're probably not giving, <laughs> they're probably not thinking what you think they're thinking. Yeah, for sure. You're, you're giving them a little bit too much credit. <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, they're really smart and they're really intuitive. And, and you know, there's times when, when I, um, I lose my patience and I would swear that my guys know that they did something wrong, but what you need to pay attention to is that when you come home and you react to that wrecked pillow or your chewed up shoes, it's, it's possibly that the dog was alone too long, got bored and oh, we'll just chew on this. Um, and it's, and it's, it's not a case of, well, I'm going to wreck mom's, um, purse because she left me alone. I mean, they don't think about the world that, that much at all. It's you that's doing that. Um, so when you come home and you find the wrecked pillow or the wrecked shoes, you, you really got to kind of suck it up, <laughs> stay calm and, and, and make your body language really neutral. Like I said before, because your dog is a master at reading. I mean, even that the smallest twitch of your eyebrow is something that he's going to interpret and, and possibly interpret incorrectly. So as you come in, you see your chewed up shoes and your shoulders drop and you sigh. And maybe you didn't, maybe you don't yell, but your dog saw that. And right away, he's thinking, "Uh Oh, there's something wrong here. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to kind of lay low or put my head down and look up with those big puppy dog eyes and hope for the best. So there's that guilty look we're talking about, right? But it's, it's just a response to whatever's made you unhappy. And he, he really, most cases, has no idea what he did. Because maybe he chewed up those shoes three hours ago. So he won't make that connection at all. Now, if you were caught him in the middle of chewing a shoe, then that would probably be a different story altogether. And you could, you could establish some clarity over, no, well, that's not your chew toy. This is that kind of thing. But, but really, um, when he sees you and you're displeased, he recognizes it, but he, he can't always connect the dots in the way that you think that he should or could. 
if you have a dog that has a habit of, of having those surprises when you get home, something chewed up that shouldn't have been, um, what do you recommend to dog owners? And, and I appreciate this is training the owners as much as it is training the dogs. But, uh, you know, you and I have talked in, in the past over, over the years about this type of thing. And, and I guess it's about making sure that they have something that's an alternative to the slippers or the remote control or the pillow to occupy their time and their mind. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Certainly for some people, some people are okay with this. Some people think it's kind of like jail, but um, making good use of um, your dog's crate, you know, for reasonable amounts of times is is one solution. Um, putting your stuff away is like incredibly effective. I mean, how many times have some, somebody left the closet door open here and I found the little tabs chewed off my runners, you know, the ones that help you pull your shoes on. Yeah. I have many shoes that don't have those tabs anymore. So you got to set this dog up for success, put your stuff away, put it up and, and definitely provide other things that are, are chewable and, and, and that means something that he really, really is interested in, you know, not something that you've picked up and you think is kind of cute. Um, you, uh, if you, if you want to keep him quiet and occupied, like maybe you need to invest in some Kongs, stuff it with something yummy that this dog likes and um, freeze it because when it's frozen, it takes a lot longer to work out the peanut butter, you know, from you know, when you're a dog. And, and so you've given him something constructive to do, something that's appropriate. And, and the thing is, with something like a Kong or, or long lasting chew, it really helps to burn off some of that extra energy that's, that's sort of collected in their brains. Because one of the mistakes that we make, too, is that we don't always address their, their needs for mental stimulation. And it's, and it's when they're bored and there's nothing better to do that they're going to maybe start, you know, just chew it on the chair that they're lounging in as they're looking out the window. I mean, I've, I've got one of those here. It needs to be reupholstered. So, you know, live and learn, boy, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I have a sofa with a hole inside of it as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> well at some point, the whole sofa needs to go. It's not yes. just the hole in the side of it. That's the problem. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about play toys or playing. And some people mm -hmm. seem to suggest that playing tug of war with your dog, with a rope or a toy can lead to more aggressiveness from them. Is that a true one? You no, know, um, I think that it can be if you have... Um, you've not established some rules to the tug game and, and you, and you start early. Uh, the first thing that your dog needs to understand is drop. It means spit that rope out when I say so. And, and some of the other rules that you want to get into your game would be like, okay, if you're creeping up the leash and your teeth, the leash, the, the rope and your teeth are getting closer to my hand games over. A good game of tug can be fun and a, and a good learning tool because um, here's your chance to teach some impulse control and to practice some of your basic cues or commands. So what you would do is, of course, teach the drop it um, and take it. Gur, gur, gur. We tug, we tug. And, and you got to make sure from your end of things that you are tugging um, sideways not going up and down that puts his head back to jerk his neck or anything like that, but a little bit of sideways movement. And then when you say, drop it, he lets it go. You take a few moments, pause, and maybe before the game resumes, and here's where your training comes in, you ask for a sit, watch, touch my hand. Okay, let's go again, take it. So you're teaching him that he does have an off and on button. And, and as you, you know, in the early days when you're teaching this, you're installing that off and off button that, that, that doesn't really exist for a lot of dogs unless you have taught it. Um, another thing that people do too is they say, oh, you, you can't let your dog win. Well, if you think about it, every time you played Monopoly, the guys that you're playing with never let you win. It wouldn't be very much fun as a game. So you got to keep in mind that, you know, it's okay for the dog to win every once in a while. Uh, providing that he's playing by the rules and he knows that, you know, if he breaks the rules, you're, you're dropping the rope, you're out of it, you're walking away. So you are control in control of the game. Consistency when training is huge, right? 
that's what your dog understands. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, these guys, these guys, re- they're like little kids in a way because they do need structure. They, they need to know that, okay, this leads to this. Um, and it has to be a, a simple sequence, of course, but you got to keep things simple because they do think in terms of black and white. And, um, and if you're changing up the rules, like, oh, well, you're not allowed on the sofa today, but tomorrow you can, he's not going to understand, well, which is it? Am I allowed up here or not? So yeah, consistency in, in anything that you're, you're doing with him is, is so important. And I want to bring up another one. And I saw this uh, in my family quite a bit when, when we had a dog uh, still, and that is when uh, speaking to your dog, um, my kids likes to speak in very long sentences when trying to get uh, uh, Charlie was her name uh, to, uh, to do things. And, and I would have to try to explain that Charlie's picking up one or two words in that whole sentence. Um, so just use the one or two words. That's pretty important when it comes to training. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. So, so imagine if um, I was speaking to you in, um, in Danish, for example, and you knew a little bit, but really in my great big long sentence, all you picked up was the word chicken. That's all you got. And it's so it's the same thing for the dog. Um, there's a far side cartoon that I just love. And there's the there's the old feller in the cartoon with the speech balloon above his head. And he's yakking away about don't do this. Da, 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 da. And and over the dog's head, there's a speech balloon. And it says, blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 ginger, blah, blah, blah. You know what? This English is a, is a foreign language to these guys, really. It's their second language. And um, at best, they're only going to pick up a few words here and there. So a great big long lecture about whatever transgression that's taking place, it's going to mean nothing. I, I, some people jabber at their dogs far, far too much. Um, and then, of course, well, that being said, I mean, of course, I talk conversationally with my dogs just because I know they, they enjoy the sound of my voice and, and that we're, you know, we're engaged in some fashion, but if I'm really wanting something specific, I, I keep it. I keep it simple. Uh, dogs like to sleep on beds um, with their owners a lot. Uh, the dogs that we've had in my house have always enjoyed sleeping on the bed, um, much to uh, my chagrin. <laughs> some people think letting the dog on the bed is giving the dog um, control of the relationship, if you will, or, or, or that you're losing control of the relationship. We've talked a lot about the things you need to do to sort of have that relationship with your dog. And I'm guessing this is similar in that uh, the dog can, you know, it, it, the issue isn't whether the dog's on the bed, it's whether the dog understands the conversation you're having of when he or she is allowed on the bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, you're talking to the lady here that, um, that has dogs that really like to have a good snuggle before bedtime. And, um, and eventually when there's three dogs on the bed, somebody's going to get too warm and take off. So that's, that's something that saves us in this household. But yeah, you're right. It, it, it should be a, a part of this relationship. And this is the respectful piece where if you say, get off the bed, the dog goes. And for the, the situation where, you know, maybe you're snuggled up in bed and, 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 and Rover's, you know, tucked under your arm and then, and then your, your, your partner comes in and Rover is growling at, at, at your partner, like, you know, forget it, buddy, you're not crawling in here. Then you got a problem. So you, you do want to make sure that there's a definite, I invite, I invite you on. And now I'm, I'm asking you to get off kind of thing. And it's, it's not a case of, you know, back to the old dominance idea. This dog is not on the bed, taking over the bed because the next conquest is going to be your bank account. He's on the bed because it's comfy, feels nice. But there we go again with uh, projecting human emotion onto the dogs that, uh, <laughs> that we think that they're, yeah, there's a big, there's, there's a conspiracy going on in their heads to take over the bed. And, and uh, as we know, we're giving them far too much credit when we say that. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, we are. Yeah. Lovely as they are. <laughs> so um, socialization of um, dogs, especially when they're young, is so very important. Um, anyone who's uh, had a puppy will have heard this. Um, and one of the things that is involved in socialization is making sure that, that the dog is exposed to other dogs. 
Um, a lot of people might assume that means taking your puppy to the dog park to meet other pooches. It's not that simple though, right? No, it's not. And, and actually, um, yeah, uh, taking your, your, your puppy to the dog park can be kind of dangerous for a couple of reasons. First of all, is everybody vaccinated? Is your puppy fully vaccinated? Um, but, but for sure, for sure, the big danger is you don't know what everybody else is going to be like down at the dog park. I imagine that um, you've taken your pup down there, you've set him down, and there's five dogs that come roaring over to check this out, this, this new guy out. Well, how terrifying is that? So, and that, that kind of experience can really have an impact on how this puppy perceives other dogs in the future. Um, so it, it's really important that at this stage, well, at any stage, that your dog has safe experiences with other dogs. Those, um, yeah, those uncontrolled scenarios um, can be, can be ad so devastating. Um, what you want to look for is uh, a well-run puppy class. Um, and, and, you know, I, I guess the, the thing about socialization, too, is that people are, are aware of the need and they talk about it, but there's not a, a full understanding of, of what that involves. And really, it's, it, it involves in introducing your pup to the big old world. And that's going to include uh, an incredible list of things. And, and you won't even get through all of them. I mean, I've certainly seen some lists, you know, that are that are put out by the training manuals. And I, I shake my head and go, well, <laughs> there's no way that that dog is going to meet a, a llama or a pony. You know, it's, so you're not going to hit everything. But but what you do want to try and do is, is pick out the things in your life, like the, the typical sounds and activities that go on in your world. You know, vacuum like cleaner the, is what I'm thinking of vacuum, as you talk to. Yeah, for sure. The vacuum cleaner um, or, or broom or even something as, as, as everyday as somebody walking into the house with their hood up on their parka can look alarming to a dog that's never seen that before or sunglasses if you think about sunglasses they can make your eyes look big and googly and of course in the dog's mind it's 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 like oh my gosh what's going on with those eyes those pupils look really dilated should I be afraid should I run so they really need to see a, a wide variety of items and and when I say see and experience those things I don't mean you know, shove your puppy into the arms of a, a really big tall man with a deep voice what in a lot of cases all you need is for that puppy to is to see the item and consider it from a distance for example um, and, and he makes the choices about whether he's going to go forward or not and you, you don't, he doesn't need to touch and sniff the things that he's considering, you know, um, unless, like one example would be, um, I'm, I'm really not happy about snakes. And, um, and we happen to have uh, quite an interesting little family of snakes living under our deck. And um, so throughout the last few summers, I've actually learned that if I'm a few feet away and nobody's shoving a snake in my face, I can handle them being there and I, and I, and I don't freak out. And so if you were to be offering me chocolate while I was standing a few feet away, that might sweeten the, the, the thing a little bit more, but it's probably not, maybe not get me to the point where I want to pick one up and snuggle it. Um, and so let's not be doing that. So it's important that your dog sees things at a safe distance and a distance that he's kind of decided on not where you go, oh, but it's okay, and shove the dog into whatever it is. So how does he know that it's okay? It's a learned experience. Uh, those who listen to the podcast often will have uh, heard of Bochi, who's our office dog. You've met Bochi before. Vacuums, brooms, and paper shredders are not his friend. Paper shredders. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's improved with the paper shredder over the years, but uh, he has actually played tug of war with the paper going into the shredder from time to time because he disagrees with the whole process. So it is, uh, it is funny, not funny, one of those situations. 
So uh, to, to, to wrap this all up, um, you want your dog to be a social member of your family. And to do so, reward good behavior. Don't punish bad behavior as that might cause even bigger issues. And don't assume that because your dog shows human characteristics from time to time that that means they understand all things human. Sound about right? <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's a pretty um, uh, condensed little version of um, you know, what you need to be doing. Having dogs in your family is, is, is awesome. They bring lots of joy. Um, as we all know, they are work. And uh, if you want to have a great member of your family uh, in the canine version, um, certainly you need to invest some time into getting them to the point where everyone's on the same page. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and I think too, that what you, what you can pay attention to is um, sort of taking little training boats throughout the day. You know, if you're in the kitchen and you're peeling potatoes and the dog is laying there doing nothing, behaving himself, then you can toss him a cookie to let him know that that was the right behavior. Any behavior that you want to see repeated, it's okay to reward that. And it doesn't always have to be the food. I mean, you can, you know, you can say, what a good dog. And he'll wag his tail and smile and go, yeah, I am, aren't I? You told me a story one time about uh, using that technique around the dishwasher to prevent the dogs from helping clean the dishes ahead of uh, going into the dishwasher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I call them dishwasher stays. And so it's it started out with, um, you know, having three, actually five dogs at one time that I, I couldn't I couldn't handle it. So and they did no downstay at the time. So everybody's in a downstay. I load one dish. I go out and I give a cookie to everybody. I go back to the dishwasher, load two dishes, cookie, 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 back to the dishwasher. Um, it takes a really long time to load the dishwasher in the, in the training stages, but um, I actually do have two dogs now that see me doing the dishwasher thing and they'll lay down and go, I'm just going to wait here for the cookies because I know that that slot machine is going to pay out. And you don't have to do it every single time, though, correct? The, the, no. They, the, they no. do understand that um, the treat may come, but it may not. Right, right. And, and actually, if you, if you show variation to your rate of delivery, that's really effective, too. So one dish, cookie, cookie, cookie. Three dishes, cookie, cookie. Five dishes, cookie, cookie. One dish, cookie, cookie. You know what I mean? And some... Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a training principle that, that works pretty neat in situations beyond just dishwasher stays. Excellent. Well, Chris, this has been fascinating. Thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your wealth of information on dog behavior with us today. Very much appreciated that you joined us on the podcast. Well, thank you. Um, this was really fun. Well, you know me. I love to talk about dogs. <laughs> so take care. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. And as mentioned off the top, you can see photos of Chris's dogs and some of her training techniques on our website, albertaspca.org, under the News tab. There you'll find all of our podcasts along with show notes for each one. On our next episode of Animal Chat, we're discussing the evolution of animal welfare with our president and retired veterinarian, Dr. Dwayne Landles. See you then. <laughs>